gonna stay. How are you? Welcome to the Candlelit Tales podcast. I'm Aaron Hegarty and I'm sitting down with me sister. I'm Sarah Hegarty and we are the co-founders of Candlelit Tales. We are indeed and we're sitting inside in the shafis and we tell all stories inside in this shafis and in pubs. We tell them live with music and atmospheric sounds and we keep the oral tradition of Irish storytelling going as much as we can anyway we started off a few years ago with support from kind people who came to our gigs and this is kind of exciting because this podcast we're recording with new headphones so we can hear it really clearly and it's great to play with the microphone my sister's looking at me scathingly because i'm going off topic uh, right yes the no, no. reason I'm just doing it for a very long time <laughs> the reason we're excited about this is because we started a pa- patreon page yeah patreon page patreon page patreon what's the patreon page again it's patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales yeah i set that up nicely didn't i yeah you did and we've got a number of little supporters they're not little they're actually normal sized they might be little i don't know we anyway. haven't met them but we we appreciate them because it is thanks to them that we have our shiny new headphones. Yeah, it's class. So you're helping us put these stories out there into the interweb. And if you'd like to do that, do that. And if you can't do that, don't bother. I just listen to the story. Speaking of. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, if you can't do that, listen to the story, but also give it a like and a share and tell all your friends about it. Oh, yeah. Be a sound fucker and like be totally like deadly about it online and tell people because people are doing that as well and going like, check this podcast out. And uh, people say to us a lot at our live gigs. We do lots of live gigs all over the place. And it's really nice when people come up to us and go, I love your podcast. Like sound, share it to somebody or, or say it online or give us a thumbs up or subscribe. That's something I'm doing with my own podcast lists. Subscribe. Yeah, subscribe so that you yeah. get like a notification when a new one comes out. All those kinds of things. Those are all really helpful because you might not have any money, but your friends might have money. And we're also a little bit um, like, I don't know, the Internet doesn't seem to like our podcast because we can't get onto iTunes. Here, iTunes, let us on, will you? <laughs> this is our <laughs> attempt to just be let on iTunes. We've tried since January to be on let on iTunes. Like, What is going on? Anyway, I don't know. They don't like us. This, so we need extra help to share it. So anyway, we'll get on with the story because we're out about to tell the story now and we'll have a bit of chat afterwards about the Fina and these are Fina stories. All right, Sarika, take it away and tell me a story. All right. You. The birth and boyhood of Fionn McCool. Long ago in Ireland, there was a great fighting force, the Fianna. Unlike the rest of society, they were bound to no place, no family in particular. They took each other as their family, and their charge was to protect all of Ireland from harm, from any threats from inside or out, creatures of the other world, invaders, from foreign lands, bandits and trouble of all kinds. They spent their summers hunting, fishing and living off the land and their winters hosted in the halls of kings and queens. Now this hosting was an easy duty for the Fianna made great guests, although they had big appetites and they would tell such tales of their summertime adventures that the winter nights would seem short. And besides that, if any king or queen hosting them were to be attacked, the Fianna would become their army. Now at one time, a rivalry grew up in the Fianna, and it all concentrated around two men. You see, there were two factions in the Fianna, you might say. Clans, almost, though not all were related. Clan Bashkna, led by Kul. Clan Morna, led by Aid. Now, Cool was the head of all of the Fianna. That was his title, he was their captain. But Aid McMorna was never happy about this. Aid thought that he would make a better leader, and he was forever grumbling over Cool's orders, finding fault with all his plans. For his part, 
Cool was reluctant to challenge Aid to a fight to settle the matter once and for all, for Aid McGuarna was a formidable fighter. None who challenged him ever walked away from it. So Cool did his best to manage the situation, to shrug off Aid's barbs, to ignore him when he was getting out of hand, to work around him. But all of Clan Morna were watching, and all of them wanted Aid as the captain of the Fianna, and so it was not easy for Cool to keep a lid on things. And all of Clan Bashkna began to resent Clan Morna, and tension mounted and mounted among the Fianna. Until one winter, Cool decided they should split for the season. Give everyone a bit of space from each other. See if they could come back in the springtime with fresh eyes. So Cool and Clan Bashkna went to live in the household of a druid named Taig. And Aid and Clan Morna went to stay in the house of the High King. Now Taig was a generous host, but he made it clear from the outset that he as a druid occupied a higher stratum of the society than a mere warrior, even the captain of a great band of warriors. He didn't rate fighters very highly. He had three beautiful daughters, and he made it very clear that the Fianna were to stay well away from them. The eldest, Bomal, was herself already a druid. The middle child, Myrna, well, she was difficult. She was a deer woman. She could run with the deer, though her father did not approve of her being outdoors when she could be studying. And the youngest, Turin, who was still a girl, though... There is another story about Turin that we'll tell another time. Now, while Taig did not like fighters, it became very clear from the outset that Myrna did not share his disdain. She loved to be outdoors. She loved the hunt herself. She ran swifter than any hound of the Fianna, and she thought fighters were a little bit sexy. So Myrna and Cool began to spend more and more time together, and over the course of that winter, Myrna fell in love. Now she warned Cool that her father would never approve, and so he suggested that he steal her, kidnap her, just kind of for pretend, and they would get married, they'd elope, and then he'd bring her back as his wife, and then... Taig wouldn't be able to object to a wedding because they'd already have had the wedding. And Myrna, perhaps underestimating just how much her father could hold on to a grudge, Myrna agreed to this plan. And Cool promptly abducted her. Now, Taig the druid was in no way prepared to allow his daughter to throw herself away on a mere warrior and he went straight to the High King to demand he set his army on the Fianna in vengeance for the insult they had done to himself and his household. The High King of course agreed, Taig had every right, but in amongst the High King's army was the Fianna who were staying with him that winter. And so it came to pass the two factions fought at last and Aid MacMorna and Cool of Clan Bashkna at last came to blows in the middle of the battlefield. Now their fight was long and their fight was fierce and Cool struck the eye right out of Aid MacMorna's skull and then Aid MacMorna took the head right off Cool's shoulders. Triumphant. He became the leader of the Fianna now, although from that day on he was no longer known as Aid McMorna, but as Gull McMorna, the One-Eyed. Myrna fled, swift as a deer. She kept moving, terrified that Gull McMorna would hunt her down because she knew she was carrying Cool's child, who might grow up to challenge him one day. 
she fled, and her footsteps were dogged by the greatest tracker, the greatest warrior of the Fianna, the Grey One of Lúcra, hideous and terrifying. Myrna did not rest. With the certainty that she was hunted growing in her mind day on day, she saw pursuit in every shadow. She laid false trails, she crossed and recrossed rivers, she ran on and on. The Grey One followed every false trail to its end, and then backtracked to the true trail, and went on. She knew she was slower than her quarry, but she knew that her quarry must rest. She could see by the way the footprints changed that this woman was with child, and growing heavier by the day. Werna waited to the last possible moment to go to ground at her sister Bomal's house. Bomal, a druid, tended her in her birth, and Myrna handed her the child as soon as he was born and begged her to take him into the wilderness to flee before the hunters of Gull Morna found them. There was a knock on the door. Bomal clambered out the window at the back of the house and fled with the infant to sleeve Naman. There, in the wildest and loneliest part of the wilderness, she set up a camp in a rude cabin and tried to figure out how she was going to keep herself and an infant alive in the wilds. The door was flung open. Now Bomal cowered in the corner, trying to hide the child with her own body, and this warrior stepped in, tall and hideous, the Grey One of Lulcra. She was renowned for her prowess as a warrior. She had trained every man of the Fianna younger than she. She could track a swallow by its flight. And looking down on the woman cowering on the ground, Lea Lulcra, the Grey One, dropped to her knee. I have been searching for you, she said. I have come to protect you for the love and loyalty I had to your father. And Vomo realised the woman was not speaking to her, but to the child. His name is Demna, she told the warrior woman. It meant little stag, in honour of his mother, the dear woman. And so Lea Lokra joined Bomo and the two of them raised little Demna in the wilds. Bomal taught him all she knew of wisdom, Lea Lucra taught him all she knew of fighting, and both of them loved him with all their hearts. When he was six years old, a beautiful woman came to visit Demna. She played with him for a whole day, put him to bed that night, sang him songs and stroked his hair until he fell asleep, and in the morning she was gone, without ever telling him that she was his mother. Demna grew up swift and strong and full of curiosity about the world outside their little patch of wilderness. He took to roaming farther and farther away from their hut in the woods, and Bomal and Lea Lucra worried for him. They knew that the time they could hide him was coming to an end, and they would have to find another way to protect him. It was Bomal who came up with the idea to send him away with a troop of travelling poets, for it was taboo to hurt a poet. No one could do that, not even Gull McMorna, and so even if he did find Demna, the child would still be safe. Now when they found those poets to take him on, they named the child Fionn, meaning fair-haired, for the lovely fair hair on his head, and they took him away, travelling the roads of Ireland. Fionn learned much on the roads, and learned much from the poets who protected him, but he found his thirst for knowledge grew beyond what they could teach him, and he wanted not just to learn the poems and the ancient sagas, he wanted to learn the craft of how to make a poem for himself. And he was directed to a wise man called Finangus. So Fionn struck out on his own, searching for a mentor, well able to fend for himself in the wilderness, and he came upon the old man fishing in the River Shannon. 
Finn Angus, the great poet and wise man. Finn Angus was somewhat preoccupied. He was bent over a fishing net on the banks of the River Shannon, staring into the water looking for a ripple. And when Fionn approached him, Finn Angus told him to get lost. He didn't need an apprentice. He had a very important task in front of him. But Fionn noticed that the old man was not taking particularly good care of himself, and so he built a fire a little ways back. He killed a goose with a sling, and he plucked it and cooked it and came back, this time with a plate of hot, delicious food. Now, once Finn Angus tasted this food, his attitude softened somewhat. This was the first hot meal he'd had in seven years. He told young Fionn that he'd heard a prophecy, that a man named Finn would catch the salmon of knowledge and get all of its wisdom for himself. Of course, Fionn had to ask him who or what the salmon of knowledge was, and Finn Angus obliged him by telling him the tale of the fish that swam through this world and into the other world, that could go along any waterway, into any place, and how every year it swam up into a particular well in a particular place in the other world, just in time, for the hazelnuts on the tree of knowledge to ripen and fall in and as soon as they splashed into that water the salmon of knowledge would eat them swallowing down all of the knowledge of all of the world and then it would swim back out along the rivers and waterways of this world everywhere seeing as well as knowing and so it had knowledge of both this world and the other world it had knowledge of all things and that made it extremely difficult to try and catch. It didn't matter how cunning, you see, were the traps that Finn Angus laid because the damn fish knew about them already. It didn't matter how quiet he was, how well he snuck because the fish knew where he was. Everything he thought of, the fish already knew about. But he'd heard that prophecy and he'd sunk seven years into this venture at this point so there was no way Finn Angus was given up before he caught that fish. So there was no way Finn Angus was given up until either he or the fish were dead. And so Fionn McCool entered into the service of Finn Angus. He took care of the old man and in the evening, when all of his fishing was done, Finn Angus would teach Fionn McCool the art of poetry. Now, maybe it was the better food and the better standard of living, but Fionn had not been in his service a terribly long time when Finn Angus was finally successful. He caught the salmon of knowledge. He gave it to Fionn to cook and lay himself down for a well-earned rest. And he admonished the lad to be very, very careful cooking this fish. And to be particularly careful not to taste the flesh of this fish. Fionn swore that he had no intention of taking this victory away from his master. And so he went diligently to cooking the salmon over the spit. He was so careful. He was so careful. He rotated that spit so carefully he didn't want a single bit of those rainbow scales to blacken. He watched it like a hawk. And then, to his horror, he saw a blister rise up in the skin of the fish. Big and fat and ugly and oily. He couldn't bear to serve the fish to Finn Angus like that. So he put out his tongue and he burst the blister. Of course, it was full of oil, which spilled out and burned his thumb and Fionn jammed the thumb in his mouth to cool it. 
Now when Finangus woke up, Fionn served him that beautifully prepared fish, and with great relish he took his first bite, and he chewed, and he swallowed, and then he stopped, and he looked at Fionn with suspicion in his eyes, and he said, are you sure that you didn't taste this fish while you were cooking it? Fionn swore that he had done no such thing. He would never. But Fenangus was not convinced. He made Fionn tell him every moment of the cooking of the fish. And Fionn, of course, confessed that he had burst a blister on its back and put his burnt thumb into his mouth to cool it. And at that, Finn Angus threw down his knife and swore. You see, with that one taste unintentional as it had been, Fionn McCool had taken all the knowledge that was in the Salmon of Knowledge into his own thumb. When Fionn protested that he did not feel any more knowledgeable than he had this morning, Finn Angus told him that that was because it was in his thumb. He had to put his thumb into his mouth. And once he did that, any question Finn Angus put to him about any obscure fact, Fionn knew the answer, just appeared into his mind. Somewhat belatedly, Finn Angus realised that the prophecy about a man named Finn catching the fish could just as easily refer to a Fionn, given that it was basically the same name, just pronounced a little differently. And so he gave the rest of the fish to Fionn McCool, seeing as how it was his destiny and all. The very first thing that Fionn McCool did with his newfound knowledge was to put his thumb into his mouth and find out where the Fiona was so that he could go and claim his birthright. Well, there we go. The epic tale of Fionn McCool and how he grew up in, well, a mountain range anyway. Okay, okay. I got the mountain <laughs> raid wrong, smartass. <laughs> he grew up in the Sleeve Bloom Mountains. I said Sleeve Naman. It's There's a different Fionn McCool story in Sleeve Naman. All right? Yeah. Yeah, we were doing this live in Galway not so long ago and uh, she said the same thing she made the mistake on live and I was like mm, not going to drop it just going to say the correct name and uh, move on from there because it was yeah. the Sleeve Blue Mountains the beautiful Sleeve Blue Mountains in Tipperary I'm nearly sure they're in Tipperary uh, now I'm actually not 100% because I'm not great at the old geography but, no uh, me neither we were actually down in Longford though last weekend uh, actually it'll be a couple of weeks ago when this comes out but we were at the Longford Tone March and there was a great there was a guy there called Simon from Monumental Ireland who really knows the landscape he does yeah it was which was really interesting because that's something that I, I'm pretty weak on I yeah. must say I mean his whole idea was that you go to the places and it's true if you ever go to Ishnak, if you ever go to Navan Fort and if you're in the places something's alive in the ground like you're like oh, I feel mad and Celtic and fucking yeah yeah well he told a story about uh, Loch Nasul which was the place where Balor's eye finished up yeah. which actually drains with a sound like thunder periodically some weird geological feature yeah stone and is like limestone or something or in this story, it's because Balor's evil eye is burning its way to the centre of the earth. Class. Yeah, like... I think cool. we told that story already. No, we didn't. We told about Balor in a previous episode. And so this is what we do. We tell a story and we have a chat about it afterwards. This is the chat. We went a bit rambly. I meant to say it at the start. Now, we're not going to talk about Balor or the places or Sleeve of Bloom anymore. We are going to talk about the Fianna, right? Because a few questions for Sorica. And basically... I thought the Fianna, you know, were just a band of brothers until recently. Yeah, well, we were sent an article by, uh, was it Caitlin who sent us the article? Mm -hmm, Caitlin yeah. Moon, who's a PhD student in Trinity. Uh, she sent us an article about the, the Ban Fian, which were the women of the Fianna, which were about a third of them. And uh, there was also quite a lot of 
information in that. We might try and link it in the show notes, actually, about yeah, yeah. basically what a Fianna was in general, because they were not, there was not just one Fianna that existed at one time and then they were gone and it was over. This was like a thing in the culture of ancient Ireland that you had these groups of kind of, because it was a very clan based system, very, very dependent on extended families. It was, I, I kind of picture it as being like almost one of those necessary escape valves where young people could just go out and kind of explore things and try thing, try and do things differently on their own. And then most of them would then at some point reintegrate back into the tribe. But some of them didn't. Right. And so this is kind of where history meets mythology and you end up with the symbology of something that means something greater in the cultural aspect, right? Sorry, I, lo- I used a load of fucking words as if I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> that, was like, that was quite convincing. That was good. Oh, it was actually nearly but I articulate, think wasn't that was, it? That was, that's, the, that's the interesting thing about it is that you are looking at an intersection of... Well, you see, this is a thing that like you are looking at an intersection of history and culture. Yeah. And we are looking at these through the lens of the culture that we grew up in. But these stories and the interesting thing about older stories in general is that they come out of a different culture. So we there's also, you know, you don't have to look at it this way, but I, I think it can be really interesting to kind of try and go, well, how was that? perceived by the culture that came up with the story you know how was that seen within an older culture right and these they seem they're, they're nomadic essentially they're living off the land they're they seem to be nomadic anyway I mean I feel like you could set up a fiend and it's basically young fellas going drinking in the graveyard do you know what I mean right, okay, that is mean. that is an Irish thing that kids do it is kind of going out into the wilds and getting yourself into trouble only maybe a little bit older and maybe not being able to come home so easily. You know, it's it's a bit more like, I think, I think in my interpretation of that, they were a bit more skitey then. Mm. But then you're also talking about a culture where raiding your, your neighbouring clans was very much a part of the fabric of life. Yeah. So it was... But there, then, then again, in terms of the symbology of breaking away from a society that doesn't make sense and join this, joining this order, this group of brethren and sisterin. I mean, that's, it that's is what, actually sisterin. That's oh, no word. way. <laughs> love, oh, that's great. I love when I make up words and they're actually words. I love it. I mean, to be fair, usually when you make up words and they're actually words, they're not the word that you were looking for. Yeah, but, uh, that happens a lot. In oh. this case, well done. So yeah, the brethren and sisterin would be... Yes. Um, <laughs> I love the sisterin. The sisterin are getting in like... <laughs> Sorry. It's... it's uh, Yeah, well, you see, this is where I think when you look at it from a modern perspective, it's kind of like you're... Oh, let's all go backpacking, kind of kids. You know what I mean? <laughs> let's all, let's all, what? let's live off the land. You know what I mean? Stinky, there's, smelly hippies. There's we've a... all seen them. We've all seen them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna weave stuff out of my own hair and sell it on a roadside. I know a lot of them. They're, like they're, so they're do I. In, they're all in Galway. They're class. <laughs> but there, I think there's that impulse in in society. I think there's always going to be that impulse, and I think you get those kind of. Uh, subcultures blossoming up in any culture where yeah. you get a group of people who are like whatever's going on in the mainstream that's not going to work for 100% of humans because we are weird contradictory animals okay so cool um, as gas as this tangent is and we could go down this rabbit hole for a while no, this no. is not a tangent we're talking about the Fianna oh, yeah. why are they necessary I'm going to take a sip of tea we might have to cut that that's alright no don't bother I love tea have a cup of tea I hope you've tea there now having a cup of I tea I love tea too but I really hate the sound of tea being drunk on really? a very sensitive microphone I mean I reckon Oshin, who's going to put music over the thing and have a little bit of an edit off this is going to be mad at it but I don't know anyway Oshin, we call him Little, little Deer now because that's literally the name <laughs> Um, he he's very cute, really. Anyway, that's a tangent. There's a tangent for you. Now, what, what Tiny, gonna... adorable, fuzzy man. <laughs> he's huge. Like, he's <laughs> Don't fucking blow it for people. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, we have this little deer man. That's just little deer man. Our little <laughs> deer man <laughs> who produces and edits the podcast. No, my question being, before we get all giddy and tea, too much tea juice, uh, is... The or what we discovered recently was how Fionn was like left off in Sleeve Blue Mountains 
with Leia Lucra and Bommel and kind of got taught by these women and nurtured by these women and eventually went off in the world and became Fionn. But he kind of, he got brought up in a very female, well, only by females. Yeah. No, he was in a very kind of isolated place and like he had the warrior woman and the druid and that one little visit from his mam. Uh, but yeah, he grew up in, in quite a bit of isolation. I always think it's interesting to kind of contrast Fionn and Cú Chulainn because they're kind of the two great, um, they're the two great heroes in Irish mythology, if you like. But they have such different upbringings. Like Cú Chulainn is so of a society that he is fostered by everybody in the tribe. Mm. Whereas Fionn is so out of society, which makes him the perfect person to lead the Fianna. Because he grows up in the wilderness. Yeah. It's not even a rejection of society. He doesn't know society. He doesn't have a place in it. And so, but he does have a place in the hierarchy and the structure of the Fianna. So when he kind of joins the Fianna, he's kind of joining the the only formal part of a group that he's ever belonged to. Like he's he's been so wild that, you know, the Fianna seem kind of tame. I think that's it. I think that's kind of the interesting thing about Fiona is that for for most of the Fiona, as you say, the Fiona is like a step closer to wilderness. And for Fionn, it's a step closer to civilization. Yeah. You know, if you think about like, you know, he he, he sleeps in tents now, you know. <laughs> and I oh, yeah, ooh, uh, fancy. And up, up on the top of the hill of Allen, looking out at the training ground as the Curra. I always love that image of him. But like, he became such a great he- hero and, and leader of, of the Fianna for such a long time. Like, it's what, he lived through three kings or something? He's meant to have lived through three different, the lifetimes of three different kings uh, he's meant to have lived for like hundreds and hundreds of years. Like yeah. that's, but then that's a that's a myth thing, yeah. you know. In order to accommodate any kind of a timeline Realism or anything like well, well, like no. But if you if you, it, it it's the way that myths, and we'll talk about this at another time a little bit more. But the way that myths kind of work is that they start to to conflate and take in. You get a hero story, and you have a culture hero. You put your culture hero in the in the role of the hero. Right. Do you know what I mean? So like in order for Fionn to have done half of the things that he does in the stories, he would have to have lived for a few hundred years. Yeah. yeah and yeah. so I think that's kind of a poetic justification for why there are so many stories. About him. God bless yeah. the poets. But one he lived of my, for 300 one years. One of my favourite stories about him is like a really short story. He takes the lads off hunting and asks them all what their favourite sound is. And the lads are like, oh, I love killing deer or I love the sound of battle. I love all this kind of stuff. And they give different examples of their favourite sound. And then Fionn McCool turns around and goes, well, no, the best sound is the sound of now. Yeah, And the sound of what is happening now. That's just such a wise, profound, meditative, Buddhist type of thing to come out from, you know, the leader of the Fianna. Listen, it tallies very nicely with modern ideas of mindfulness meditation. Right. And so, you know, it's it's a nice one to pick up on. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you also I also think, you know, you can't go making any of the heroes of Irish mythology too golden and shiny. No, nah, because he fucks up with the whole Dermot and Grania. Oh, and he does some he does some nasty shit. And, yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. that's part of my favorite thing about Irish myth is that, you know, there is no there's no black and white here. Yeah, you know? we, and we've talked about that a fair bit in fairness of like, you can't pick someone's side because they will be a little bit evil or they will well, show like, goodness, but you know. They're humans. they're humans. And so the greatest, and that's, I think that's the interesting thing about Fionn is that he's such an exemplary person and he's such an exemplary man and even such an exemplary man cannot remain perfect forever mm. and does not remain perfect forever. And yet he becomes a foster father for loads of the Fianna, loads of the heroes. He kind of brings them to a new height. He gets them to, uh, you know, not only pass the deadly tests, but also like to to learn off all of the books and, and be able to like he trusts. Yeah, him. yeah. He 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 up he ups their game. Like he makes the Fianna better by being there. In my mind, it's kind of like he's he's he starts a kind of a man's group, you know, with the lads with drumming circles and like. 
tapping into feelings and like you know they, they cry a lot they, they, I mean yeah, you're, away. you're also you're also again talking about this from our cultural perspective yeah, the it. idea of men not dying or sorry of men, men not, not crying. crying is incredibly recent in our culture yeah, yeah, yeah. you're talking like 100 150 years that's what I mean like so in my head they're, they're, they're so in touch with everything like there is yeah. you know they're <laughs> crying they're hugging they're probably shagging each other that's like, not one of the things they would have had to be escaping from yeah, yeah, yeah. in their culture men cried yeah you know, in their baseline, men cried. So they didn't need to have a men's group that was just for men. That's why this was this is interesting that like a third of the Fianna at any given time were women. So it's not about an isolationist men's retreat because that doesn't need to happen because that stark imbalance isn't there. Hmm. Because women aren't forced out of violence and men aren't forced out of emotion. And, and so women are allowed to get proper fucking angry without being proper, called crazy. Yeah. And, you know, they're, you know, just... The same. Uh, yeah. Well, it's that like the split that we have in modern culture is in its essence is that women are not allowed to be angry and men are only allowed to be angry. Yeah. And that's what fucks everybody up. Fucks us all up, lads. So but I tell you what, here's the cure. Um, women go out there and break a plate and lads go off and listen to last week's podcast called So You Can Have a Cry For Yourself, OK? <laughs> you know, if you want. Or maybe maybe, maybe it won't tickle your feelings that way. Well, like, but yeah, I think that's that's, you know, it's it's a question of balance and it's a question of rebalancing. And in, you know, most armies where women are allowed in, I think it, that is the proportion. Yeah. You don't you don't tend to get a straight 50 50 split, but it's it's a kind of a two thirds, one thirds thing. Yeah, um, that's a, a better approximation of how gender like differentiates us, you know, definitely. Yeah. And when it's not such a huge like issue where you know, one gender is barred and the other gender has to carry all of that aggression themselves, then you don't get the kind of um, imbalances and destructiveness. Yeah, there is a nice way to look at that. Is it like, OK, so again, looking back at the old stories to to learn a bit of a lesson about now kind of always seems every time I tell a story, every time I listen to a story, I kind of hear or pick up on something new. Mm. And it's like, these are ancient fucking stories. You know, they're mad but they're in the culture for a reason because they were the best ones and they had a reason to be kept alive. You know, there was a reason to keep telling them and there is yeah. a reason to keep on learning from them. And if that's, you know, even that simple idea of, yeah, lads, just fucking feel all the feelings. And yeah, women, just fucking get angry. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid of getting angry. But I honestly, you know, I think that's a fucking thing that isn't said, you know. Yeah. So I'm saying it. I'm fucking saying it. I think we're going to Talk about okay. more Fianna stories next week. Yes. Now that Aaron has solved patriarchy. I mean, it definitely <laughs> happened. Uh, <clears throat> right. That's where you went with that one. All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, so listen, uh, we're going to be talking about more of the Fianna stories next week. and uh, Well, in, in two weeks, because we're, we're still only on, a, on an every two week schedule. If you would like to hear more podcasts from us, though, we know exactly how much money we need in order to make that happen. And it's on our Patreon. Yeah, so check out our Patreon page uh, for giving us a little bit of something, even if just for a while. Uh, if you if you want to give us something for a while, that'd be great. It helps out a load because you know there's just there's, there's costs and stuff for being a broadcast artist. Anyway, um, you can also find out where we're doing live gigs up online we constantly update our Facebook page uh, we're always doing gigs lads and it's great to be doing them we're keeping these stories alive we love doing it now this uh, podcast was produced by Oshin Ryan uh, it's been sponsored by you the listener uh, the few people who have donated to us which is deadly we really appreciate you thank you very much and thank you for the support uh, if you can support us, like us and share us and make a comment underneath, ask us a question. We've gotten around to a few of the, uh, the questions or stories that people have asked us to tell. So I hope you've enjoyed them. Get back to us. Let us know what you think. Um, if, you know, we also do bookings and stuff. So get on to us about loads of stuff. Uh, if you want, we're busy out. We love telling stories and playing music with them and seeing where this inspiration brings us next. I hope you've been inspired by something uh, because we're constantly hearing about stuff like that, paintings and whatnot. So our social media handles are at Candlelit Tales. We're on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. You can use hashtag Candlelit Tales podcast to share this podcast with your friends. And if you want to get in touch with us directly, 
It is info at candlelittales.ie or our website candlelittales.ie. And if you want to book us, it's bookings at candlelittales.ie. Or Google us. And uh, yeah, be grand. You know, candlelit tales. You. <laughs> <laughs>